Hello and welcome to COVID-19 Right Now from the Yale School of Public Health. Uh, I'm James Hamblin. I am a lecturer in health policy and I am joined today by Jack Teebs. He's a professor of psychology and of epidemiology and he's chief psychologist at the Connecticut Mental Health Center among many other titles and also Marnie White who is an associate professor of public health and an associate professor of epidemiology and of psychiatry. Um, and we're going to be talking generally about mental health today. If you have um, questions, we would love to hear from you in the comments and we will address them later on in the conversation. But thank you both so much for joining us today. And I'd like to start just by asking, because things are moving so quickly and there are so many issues to consider, what is at the very front of your mind right now? What is keeping you up at night? Or hopefully not keeping you up at night. Uh, Marnie, could you go first? Sure, absolutely. Um, thanks for that introduction and thank you for inviting us to be here to talk about mental health and resilience. Um, the first thing that comes to mind to me and something that's been um, coming up a lot in discussions um, with clients and, and, and students as well is some of the collective anxiety about misinformation and kind of feeling overwhelmed with respect to all of the coronavirus specific media reports and people really trying to make sense of it and understand just how anxious they should be. Um, and so I'm actually really grateful to your broadcast for providing this really important, very objective and science-based information to the public. So thank you for doing that a lot. Um, and then beyond that, um, uh, my concerns are, are specifically that people um, uh, are experiencing a great deal of distress, um, mostly having to do with uh, the unknown um, and trying to rely upon their um, current levels of resiliency and wondering how long this is going to, to go. Um, and of course, we don't have answers to that at the moment. So that's sort of the things that we've been working on and considering and trying to um, communicate to help people. Right. No, I'm feeling that. I mean, in my work as, as a journalist, feeling like people want these answers. And if I can give more definitive answers, it would be able to help them contextualize and allocate their anxieties in a way that felt less overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And yet, I also don't want to overstate the certainty of our answers. So, um, no, I feel it in both directions. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And, and, and could I, can I throw to you, uh, Jack? Yeah, happy to. Uh, you know, what keeps me up at night is how can we get, how can really we get help to people that really need it? Um, you know, think of the medical staff, frontline providers, or for folks that are off service, you know, how can we get them help? How can we get family members help? How can we get people living in the community who've been laid off or who've had their jobs turned upside down or are now working at home with kids? How can we get the teachers and the the children who have to now do schooling in a different context. So what keeps me up is to think about all the layers in which we can get help and support, information, um, maybe destigmatizing some of the things that people are feeling as normal in response to this pandemic, and um, thinking how our institutions can support those efforts. Yeah. Which, uh, oftentimes they often don't think they, that's part of their job, but it, but it really is their job. That gets to the first thing I wanted to ask about, the sort of destigmatizing. This has been a constant challenge in mental health for a very long time. You know, we need to help people understand that, that these are illnesses to be treated accordingly, taken very seriously, um, and, and not have people simply be told that, you know, buck up or, or just, you know, be tough. Um, and now there are a lot of people who are meeting potentially diagnostic criteria in some ways for for the disease criteria and um depending on their access to care or depending on how overwhelmed healthcare systems are may or may not be considered diagnosable with depression versus told you know there are things you can do to get through this um i'm wondering about um and whoever would like to, to start off with this first is, is, is changing the way clinicians um, are or should consider who 
who, ha who, who is considered a diagnosed with depression, who is going through a contextual, the trauma of the circumstances and uh, economic and social issues and all kinds of things that are important with this and, um, you know, don't need to seek, might not need to seek medical care. Um, I'm sorry, that's a broad question. It could go a lot of different directions, but it's challenging some notions. And um, I'm curious, wh what is your read on where that stands right now? I'm happy to start, maybe Marty, pick yeah. up with, uh, you know, I think uh, everybody is feeling stress right now. Everybody, there isn't a person, that you're, it's not a normal thing, everyone, a normal response is stress. And that along with stress comes a lot of other reactions. People are not performing as well. They're not kind of as nice as they normally are to other people. They're maybe not feeling so good as the, about themselves. Um, everyone's feeling that and that, that look can look symptomatic. We know that after a period of time, if that persists, it can become uh, a psychiatric disorder. And that's when help is absolutely needed for sure. Um, but for most people, they'll reach out to their social networks, their friends and family, their faith community, people that they trust that have been there for them in the past, and that will help them get through this time. Those individuals may have suggestions about things that can be helpful to build their own resilience. They can also look to supports that are available online for supports. And I think, again, if institutions, um, uh, you know, companies, uh, schools, others have resources that and opportunities for people to get together to support one another, they can actually find some of the strategies that will help them get through this time. And then for those that have persistent symptoms, then certainly to reach out and get professional help. I sometimes approach it from a, a slightly different, yeah, I've, sometimes my general approach is a slightly different um, angle in that I usually like to encourage people to seek, um, if not treatment, at least additional levels of supports um, and maybe even in excess of their typical channels. So, for example, um, I would encourage people to, to have some of the um, online or device uh, administered interventions such as the um, therapeutic apps and thought monitoring and mood monitoring and those things. And I, I frequently encourage this even for students at Yale who are undergoing, um, you know, chronic stress uh, in the face of, you know, very competitive degree programs, for example. And I sometimes try to reduce the stigma surrounding mental health and mental distress by encouraging students to perhaps seek professional care much more readily than what they would deem themselves to be a clinically significant threshold. So for example, um, and the, the parallel that I'd like to make is to perhaps consider um, mental wellness intervention as like a spa treatment for the emotions. Um, we're very uh, you know, quick to encourage people to take care of their physical health in a destigmatizing manner. Oh, if you're hurt, if you're experiencing pain, go to the doctor. But I don't feel like we get that same message with respect to mental wellness. And people are often um, take the approach of trying to white knuckle it and persist to a point that they might be in a, a real area of crisis. And so I sometimes want to encourage a more gentle approach towards mental health, meaning that um, encouraging people to seek out additional level of support at the earliest sign or symptoms. Um, but I hear everything that Jack is saying with respect to a lot of people already have a, a level of, of resilience and they can rely upon their typical support networks. Um, but I also kind of want to look for pink flags and encourage people that it might be time to, to step it up a little bit, particularly since this is such I've lost my oh. audio there. Sorry about that. Momentarily. Uh, okay. my Sorry, maybe that was just me. Um, I, I hear absolutely what you're saying. I, and I feel also that I'm hearing also about shortages of 
place stresses on a, a healthcare system in lots of different ways. Um, it, I know from a, a respiratory practitioner level, people are saying, you, you know, you can't, don't come to the hospital and try to get a test in hard hit areas until you're very sick in a way that I think some doctors feel uncomfortable with. They'd like to see people come in earlier so they can get a baseline check, run a test, just monitor you mm -hmm. and watch for a crash in case it happens. But we don't have that capacity in some places. Are we seeing similar issues with mental health where um, it might be ideal that everyone came in um, or at least had access to telemedicine to, to check in as soon as there are early symptoms? Um, but we can't because so many people are experiencing um, symptoms right now that we ha we have to prioritize in other in other ways. Or do you think we have the capacity to treat and address things as widely as you're suggesting, Marnie? Um, I think that there is kind of a, a graduated approach to it. So there are, for example, many online services and teletherapy. Um, services out there. Jack would certainly be better able to speak toward the demand uh, that's taking place with the mental health systems, um, and particularly because I, I know that you're working with uh, frontliners. Um, and so I think that that's a very different question and issue than kind of the, the, the what might be affecting um, the general community. Um, and in terms of you know people's access and affordability, um, I mean the one thing that um, I think there's potential for a silver lining out of all of this is that um, there might be increased acceptability of these teletherapy and telemedicine approaches, um, which you know the field has been studying for decades now um, as a means to disseminate. Um, mental health services more affordably and also at greater distances than otherwise exists and what people typically think of with respect to therapy of, you know, getting up and going to an office and sitting there for an hour and, and really scaled approaches have been tested and have been found to be quite effective. Um, so even things like five minute check-ins with, um, with a mental health provider can be extremely beneficial. Yeah, Jack, what do you, what do you think in terms of, uh, innovations in scaling and, and at what level people are, maybe should be seeking out at least some sort of preliminary care? Well, I agree with Marnie. I think the use of telemental health now has really uh, uh, increased dramatically as a result of this. And it's, it's been really encouraging how accessible it is, how much people feel comfortable using it, especially younger folks who, for whom a phone is a key vehicle of communication more generally. Um, and that's really been helpful. It's increased access in a lot of ways during this time, particularly for people that were already in treatment. Um, and so we, that's going to be something that's going to be with us after um, this pandemic is over. It's going to be a way that we need to think about uh, scaling mental health services in a way that reaches people more directly through uh, ways of communicating that they like. Um, I think one of the things we learned more broadly after 9-11 is that there was an expectation that many people would come and uh, into the mental health system in large numbers. And although there was an increase, it wasn't what we expected. And what we found was that People use their existing social networks to get help and get support. And uh, that was often the, the main way in which people received help. Uh, and one of the things that's happened in response to this pandemic is that there's been a much more uh, a broader array of institutional responses to support people during the pandemic. Uh, for example, the, the uh, initiative that I'm leading on, on behalf of the Department of Psychiatry is to bring together um, individuals by conducting interactive stress and resilience town halls, which we do every day uh, for the broader Yale medical, but also Yale affiliated hospitals throughout the state. It's a large group of people that can have an opportunity to attend these town halls. And we're now working with individual departments and individual hospitals to support some of their staff. But that's only one part of a broader institutional response that includes one-on-one -on -one professional support, caring for caregivers, as well as um, buddy systems, as well as um, uh, helplines that people can access through the broader institution. And I think 
business owner's treatment later on if appropriate. Right. I see a little silver lining there and that people are starting to interact with mental health care who might have previously thought it was just not going to ever be a part of their, their lives. I think there are still some people who, who don't feel comfortable utilizing these services even when they're available or don't know exactly when or feel the stigma of it. Um, or who may have family members who they think need to seek care, who they've tried to be supportive of family members, but they're just not sure if this is more than they can handle. Um, is there, are there general guidelines for the, um, assuming we can't just tell everyone who's feeling, you know, um, a lack of hope or loss of motivation, you know, transiently that, that they need to seek out one of these services, um, a line where we could tell family members or something, you really need to look out for these, these sort of indications and get this person to professional level care. Well, I don't know, Barney, you have... Hey, I always rely on our diagnostic systems of, uh, you know, in mental health, we certainly have uh, a, a, a set of signs and symptoms across the various uh, mental disorders that we consider to be clinically significant. And the one that's common throughout all of them is interference with social and occupational functioning. So the point at which um, one's mood or um, difficulty sleeping or anxiety or the, the various symptoms that they're experiencing with respect to physical and uh, behavioral and cognitive uh, problems um, interferes with their ability to care for their families or uh, interact with social networks or get their job done. Um, and I think that's particularly difficult to disentangle right now considering there is sort of a system-wide interference of social and occupational functioning. Um, so how to, to tease that apart right now is, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I think it's, it's clearly individually subjective. Um, um, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to ask an no, impossible. No, 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 absolutely. I, know, I it, would say. It's something I'm hearing from my readers and they wanna know, you know, and obviously there are clear red flags, but I don't know if there's any general general wisdom for where we where we're drawing that line right now well if i would say though that if you have any doubt about yourself or concerns about yourself and you feel comfortable calling you should absolutely call and check that out call a mental health provider uh, some of the hotline services that can make a referral for you absolutely if you feel concerned about someone else um, but you, or you feel, feel concerned about yourself but don't want to call feel it's too stigmatizing that's when you talk to someone you trust family member uh, maybe a person in the clergy, maybe a person that's at work that you can trust about these things. That's when you talk to some other people because sometimes when you get yourself reflected back in another person, you see yourself in a new way that may allow yourself to, to get help. And right. that's a really important thing. That connection with other people can be the vehicle for help. I've heard also the suggestion that when you reach out to people who know you, even if they're not particularly friends, but people who know your normal baseline, they might be a, a, sometimes a screening tool that even someone, you know, on a hotline who's never spoken to you before, maybe not saying you have to choose one or the other, but they can be people who can recognize that you're just simply different from how you normally are and that that can itself be a warning sign even if a person on a hotline didn't pick up on a, on a warning sign uh, because they don't know your baseline. Right. Um, uh, okay, sorry, that's not even a question, that's just a poorly phrased comment. Um, Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm wondering um, about longer term implications for, um, you know, c our concepts of mental health and our systems of delivery and things that you see happening right now that could forever change what we that, you know, the, either the way we conceptualize disease or um, the way we understand suffering or the way we deliver care? I would say two clear things. One is telemental health is going to be with us now going forward. Not going to be the only or the primary modality, but it seems like there's a lot of positives to that in, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Second thing is I think there is going to be a destigmatization of mental health problems that people have. 
more like challenges. Mental health problems may be viewed as more challenges. Challenges like other kinds of challenges, physical health challenges or learning challenges of some kind, because everyone is gonna have a response to this pandemic that's gonna require some support, some assistance, some care, um, and that, that's gonna normalize this, which is gonna be a positive development going forward. Yeah. You're nodding along, Marnie, did you want to? I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, this is uh, obviously those of us who are in the mental health world, this is our passion, this is what we care about. And it's, it is very distressing as professionals to be like, please, please access our services that we provide and to experience that on a social level that people are very hesitant to do so. Um, and it's just, uh, I think there's a, a lot of value in what the field does, um, and particularly as it then relates to physical well-being. Um, we know so much now about how mental, mental and physical well-being are, uh, interact with one another, and um, to try to, you know, just welcoming any kind of um, uh, social change with respect to enabling people and encouraging them to take care of their mental well-being is just so critical. And whether that be seeking services or doing more prevention type of, of work. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of messages to um, the public about ways to safeguard their physical well-being and you know, physical health, you know, everything from hygiene and, and a lot of the messaging that's going on right now with respect to how to respond to the coronavirus epidemic. We're telling people you know, to wear masks and to wash and to not touch your face and to uh, employ physical distancing, but we are maybe not as good about um, uh, not only providing education, but also the tools uh, to help people care for their mental and emotional well-being. Right. That brings me to the final question that I have. And if there's anyone watching who wants to ask a question, please drop it in the chat. Um, you have a course on, uh, on self-care that is now, I guess, available on, on Coursera. Yeah. And I was wondering if um, you had any, um, in a, in a brief moment, what are the most important things that people could, or maybe what's just one thing that, that everyone could be doing right now under these particular circumstances that you think a lot of people are neglecting? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that uh, what what we're observing uh, is that um, when individuals in chronically stressful situations, um, that is to say the coronavirus epidemic, um, engage in very small self-care behaviors of any kind. It could be specific to stress reduction, um, mental health, mental well-being, something that they're doing with respect to physical activity, or even making small nutritional changes. All of those serve to increase their self-efficacy or their sense of accomplishment over setting a goal and sticking to it. And that seems to be the mechanism through which people are experiencing um, improved mental health, um, or at least a reduction in the diminished mental health that we might anticipate here. And it's, it seems to be a very powerful um, self-applied intervention, self-chosen. And so we're seeing people doing everything from choosing to pick up, you know, a journaling or a coloring or artistic or music or watching comedy. And it's a very broad spectrum of things that we're seeing uh, individuals um, choosing for themselves as something to just benefit their emotional or mental space. Um, and it's, it's unhopeful. Um, the, right. the, we'll continue to see those effects um, as as the pandemic continues. I've I've heard that setting reasonable goals that something you can do and achieve and accomplish and make sure you're doing it, um, and not just saying I'm just going to work out more and eat better and uh, these big broad things where you're going to always feel inadequate like you didn't actually exactly accomplish it because exactly. you could always be doing better. Um, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Jack? Well, I th yeah, very much so. I agree, completely agree with Marnie about that. There's the other thing that we're hearing. We've we've had about 1,400 people in these almost 50 town halls that we've done that, about these, and what we're hearing is also very consistent with with the research. One of the things that's really helpful is the power of routines. Building in a routine, a, a regular routine, not just the start your day but throughout the day routines to help give structure for your day if there's something that we 
maybe didn't realize until this pandemic is that how much our routines are a scaffold for our life. We wake up a certain time, we eat breakfast, we do other things, we have coffee, we have lunch. It's around our workspace, perhaps. Um, if we have kids, our kids have a routine. And all of a sudden, those routines have been upended. And so part of our job to get our life back in together, to get control over some of the uncertainty, is to just do a, set up routines for the simple things. And as Marnie's saying, you know, that's, that can go, making a choice about your routine is also really important. But having a routine is really making a difference for people. And uh, so I encourage thinking about that. Yeah, I, I'm hearing the same thing. Even if it seems arbitrary, like what, why should I uh, need to put on the tie I always put on? Well, you know, because it's part of a routine. Uh, so you might not actually need to wear a tie, but if you, it's part of your life, then you don't, maybe you don't need to stop. Um, we have one question and then, and then we'll, we'll close. And that's a question slash comment, which is my favorite kind. Um, what degree do you think policymakers and political decision makers are thinking about mental health for their communities? I'm sure there are a lot of different ways that people are prioritizing that really well and really poorly. Um, but let, maybe let's focus on the well, because we know that people have neglected this issue for a long time and surely are now. But what are you seeing as heartening or um, hopeful in the realm of policymakers? I think, I think right now we've, we've been so focused on getting care for people uh, medically so that they can be saved so that they can be treated properly and get discharged from the hospital and go home back to their life. So mm -hmm. that's been really the, the, the main focus. And then secondarily, what is the impact this is doing emotionally on medical care providers and family members? And so that's where the men mental health side has been really focused on. But I think this next phase of recovery is going to be on the broader public. Um, as we move out of the crisis, which isn't going to be soon because we've seen the curves in the rest of the country outside of the greater New York area going up, but, but we're going to, I think, start to scale in mental health uh, needs much more uh, uh, as we go down the road. Marnie? Yeah, I've already been seeing some, at least at the local level, um, uh, even from the local towns and school systems who have actually been focusing a good bit on this, on um, various local level task forces and trying to um, provide education to children in public schools and their families around various mental health or pro-health strategies um, around emotions and trying to um, speak to children and help them um, moderate their stress and anxiety around this as well. I've been actually really impressed with a lot of the efforts that I've seen thus far. Yeah. Well, so many of the responses I hear uh, so often on this topic are we just need to, to destigmatize and have a conversation and open up dialogue. And sometimes it takes a crisis for that to actually happen. So um, it sounds like that is starting to, at least in places where this is self-care and uh, attendant, attendant attention to one's own mental health or at least a part of everyday conversation much more often than they were. Um, and um, Jacob, we have a final thing. Someone's uh, curious about where you can get more information on the town halls um, that you mentioned. So you can go to uh, uh, the Yale website. If you Google uh, care for the caregivers, you will get uh, uh, Yale Care for Caregivers, get you to a website. The first option is Building Resilience, and you click on that, and you can see just a range of options. Town halls are one of them, but it includes one-to-one, -one, uh, other kinds of supports that are being available to people. Um, so Yale Care for the Caregivers, and Building Resilience is the first tab. Click on that, and you have the range of options, kind of a continuum of support for people, uh, that can also help people who are in mental health need right now, but or provide more general support and, and resources. Jack, are those available to the general public or only people who are connected to the Yale hospital system or the Connecticut hospital system? A lot of the hospitals in Connecticut have affiliations or links to Yale, so it covers a lot of people and family members. Uh, but there's also opportunities if people want to email me, I'm happy to uh, jacob.teebs at yale.edu. 
um, be happy to uh, respond to you and link you to resources. We've created a resource page uh, for a lot of different needs uh, on that website that uh, it's part of the Stress and Town Halls, web, Yale Stress and Town Halls website. If you go to that resource page, uh, you'll get others, but you can also email me directly. Again, jacob.teebs at yale.edu, and I'll, and I'll get you what you need. Thank you both so much, uh, Marnie and Jack, for, for all your work and for sharing, sharing with us today. And um, best of luck to you. Thanks so much for having us. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching.